Hello, this is the Council on Independent Fundamental Bible Doctrine. This is my second video, Pursuing Perfect Doctrine in the Area of Covenant Theology, Taking Covenant Theology to Complete Biblical Understanding. There is a lot of stuff out there about covenant theology. As most people know, a covenant is a promise made by God. There are many covenants in the Bible, such as the Noahic covenant, where God promised Noah he would not destroy the world by water again. That is just one of many promises. The promises we're going to look at are the two covenants that divide humanity and relate to the salvation doctrine. The keys to understanding the two covenants that I hold to, okay, that have a little bit of a different take on it than your normal covenant theology, I'm just going to start out by reading them, and then I'm going to show you the Bible verses that demonstrate these keys, okay? The two covenants are the death covenant of law and the life covenant of faith. Both the death and and life covenant began in the Garden of Eden and run concurrently, that is at the same time, through all time and continue today and will go on forever. Forever. Some will be in the everlasting life and some will be in everlasting death. The Jewish death covenant was a corporate restatement of the global covenant of law in which every individual in the world from all time was already a member individually. Okay, if you're dying, you're under the condemnation of the law. If you're under the condemnation of the law, then you broke the law. If you broke the law, there had to be a law. Okay, the two covenants separate people, not time periods. Ultimately, the unsaved from the saved. Okay? The Jewish covenants also served as pictures of the global individual covenants. For example, the Old and New Testament. The Old and New Testament sound different. Okay? Both covenants, the covenant of life and the covenant of death, are in the Old Testament and both covenants are in the New Testament. The covenant of death by the law and the covenant of life by faith are in both testaments. Okay? It's just that the Old Testament was written with a focus on the death by the law covenant. The New Testament was written with a focus on the life covenant okay that's why the two testaments sound different it's not because the covenants were time periods okay it's because God wanted a picture of each of his covenants and so the Old Testament is written with a focus on the death covenant and the New Testament is written with a focus on on the life covenant but both covenants existed in both testaments the beginning and ending of the Jewish law covenant was the beginning and ending of the picture not the global covenants okay so stay with me and you're gonna understand covenant theology completely all right the beginning of the death covenant of law Romans 3.20, by the law is the knowledge of sin. We can identify the law by what it does. It identifies sin. So if something tells you what is sin, then that is the law. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. If you break the law, you have sinned. And for the wages of sin is death. When you sin, you will die. Where in the Bible do we first find this schematic? Genesis 2.16, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, 
But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So we have something that tells us what sin is. And its violation leads to death. That's a law of God. Commanded. Thou shalt not eat of it. Kind of sounds like thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery. Okay, that's a law of God. Okay, Adam and Eve were obligated to the law from the creation. They were not under its condemnation as they had not broken it yet. But notice that, you know, they were still obligated to do it. And notice that when they did break it, what was the punishment? Death. People, death is the condemnation of the law. This was a law of God. And the law of God was the promise of break the law, or the covenant of law was the promise by God of breaking the law and die. And that was there from the beginning. That is the covenant of law. That's the covenant of death by the law. If there is death, there is the breaking of the law. If there is the breaking of the law, then there is a law. <clears throat> the life covenant of faith. Anytime God says something, it's a promise in which you can believe or not believe. Okay? So, the interesting thing is, it's inherent. It's inherent when God says something. All right? And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day thou eatest of it thou shalt surely die. So, if they believe God, then they live forever. So what did Satan tell Eve? And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day thou eatest thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So God said one thing, Satan said the opposite. Who did Eve believe? Satan's word. To whom did she demonstrate unbelief? God's word. So how long would she have lived if she would have believed the testimony of God's word? everlasting life okay so was eating the fruit the sin yes but at its core she ate the fruit because of unbelief in the testimony of the word of god the core of every sin okay is a lack of faith if i steal Let's say I find a wallet and it's got $100 in it and I could really use the $100. But God has told me, thou shalt not steal. And God has told me, I shall meet all thy needs. Okay? If I take that $100, okay, then I am demonstrating that I do not believe that God is going to meet all my needs. I have more faith in the $100 than the Word of God. You see, all sin... At its core is a lack of faith. That's why those two verses are in there. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Whatsoever is not of faith is, is sin. Okay? It wouldn't have been the works that caused Eve to live forever, ultimately, at their core, if she would have not eaten of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and continued to eat of all the other trees. Because she believed God, okay, then she would have lived that forever based upon believing the testimony of the Word of God. Okay, the two covenants are there from the beginning of creation. All right, the two covenants, for it is written that at Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid and the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman 
was by promise. Okay, promise. What is a promise? It's something stated that somebody tells you. God gives us a promise and we believe it or not believe it. Okay. All right. Which things are an allegory for these are the two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, the bondage of sin and death. But Jerusalem, which is above, heavenly Jerusalem, not earthly Jerusalem, is free, which is the mother of us all. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. If you are in the faith, you're the child of promise. Okay, promise of eternal life through faith. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit. See, you're born into Adam's flesh with sin dwelling in your members. Okay? To get out of the death by the law covenant, you have to be born again by the Spirit into the life covenant. Born again, okay, from bond to free, Okay, from death unto life, all those sayings in the Bible that communicate the path of salvation, they are sayings that show us the movement from the death covenant of the law to the life covenant of faith. It is a movement from one covenant, being the promise of death by the law, to the life covenant, the promise of everlasting life through faith. Okay? Even so it is now. Okay, now. Paul is saying it's this way now, after Christ died. Still under the flesh of the law. And the birth of the Spirit. Both covenants exist now at Paul's day. Those who are in this covenant persecute those who are in this covenant. The covenants separate people. They run concurrently through all time and everybody is in one covenant or the other. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. Okay? We are heirs of eternal life through faith because we are free from the death of the law. Okay? Let's go on. <clears throat> Israel's first covenant, the law. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke. Okay, Israel broke the first covenant. Okay, they broke the first covenant, which was a restatement of the death covenant of the law. Keep the law and stay in the land, break it and die. The first covenant puts you under the condemnation of the law, death. There was no covenant of life in the covenant of the Mosaic law. Okay? It wasn't supposed to be. The Old Testament was written specifically with a vantage point to give us a picture of the death covenant. Now, both covenants were there, but the Old Testament was written to give us a picture of that death covenant. Okay? There was no life in the death covenant as there is no life in the law. The law is in the death covenant, not in the life covenant. Okay? Let's look at the second covenant, Israel's new covenant. 
Romans 11.25, blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Whoa, that's the end times. Fullness of the Gentiles come in. That's the end times. They're blind until then. <clears throat> and so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion a deliverer. That's end times. When all of Israel is saved... They're blind until all the Gentiles be come in. Okay. Then all of them are going to get saved. A deliverer comes out of Zion. This is all end times. And shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. The second covenant, the covenant of life, is going to cleanse sins. Okay. The covenant of law told you what the sins are and when you broke them you were deserving of death the life covenant cleanses you of the sins okay see they're pictures of the global individual covenants okay jeremiah 31 33 but this shall be the covenant that i will make with the house of israel after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts, and I will write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be, future tense, my people, and they shall all teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. No more. They don't even have to give the gospel anymore. Why? For they shall all know me from the least unto, of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and will remember their sin no more. Forgiveness. That's the new covenant. They're going to know God through the forgiveness of sin. That's the new covenant. That's going to occur, okay, at the end times. Okay, so the new covenant is, is going to be knowing the Lord through the cleansing of sin, not the avoidance of sin, not through following the law, but through the forgiveness of sin. Okay? The forgiveness of sin removes you from the condemnation of the covenant of the law. You no longer have to die eternally because you've been forgiven for the times when you didn't turn from your sin. Okay? Because salvation is through your forgiveness. Okay? Salvation is through the forgiveness of sin, not sin avoidance. Okay? But let's look again at some more points about when this is going to take place. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Oh, all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Sounds like end times. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. They're going to make supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they pierced. Oh, it's at his return when they see him. In that day there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem as the morning of whatever that word is, in the valley of Megiddo. Well, in times. In that day there shall be a fountain opened unto the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and uncleanliness. He's going to cleanse their sin. And remember, they're blinded until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. This is in times. Hosea 5.15 Now I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. Seek my face. Make supplications. He's going to return to his place until they acknowledge their offense and make supplications. So he comes. Okay. They look upon him whom they pierced. They begin to make supplications to him, seeking his face. Okay. As they are afflicted afflicted in their affliction they will seek me early who's afflicting them come and let us return unto the lord for he hath torn and he will heal us up he hath smitten and he will bind us 
they did not believe, okay, by the time Christ came the first time. They looked upon him whom they pierced, and then they realized their mistake. He pours out their wrath on them, his wrath on them. They make supplications, call upon his name. He drives the remaining unbelieving of Israel to himself, okay, to believe in him, okay. He will smite us and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us, and the third day, he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord. Remember the other passage, for they shall all know me. His going forth, his coming, is prepared as the morning, and he, sh he shall come unto us as the rain. It's the end times. That's when God saves all that remain of Israel, a remnant, a small amount that remain. Okay. He's not talking about all Israel is in all Israel. Not all Israel is saved because they're Israelites. They have to believe to be saved. Okay. And if you don't believe that, then explain Korah. When the earth opened up and swallowed him and his all his followers, and they went straight to hell alive. Okay. <laughs> You're not saved because you're a Jew. You're saved if you believe. Okay? That's why the New Testament says you become a child of Abraham when you believe. Not all people who are Israelites are really Israelites. Okay? Because if you want to be in the family of God, you have to have faith. It's not genetics. It's faith. Okay? The new covenant is given to Israel at the end of Christ's second return. Okay, here's the question, though. <clears throat> Does this covenant for the forgiveness of sins not already exist today? Yes, individually. Okay. The covenant with Israel... The new covenant with Israel for the forgiveness of sins is a restatement corporately to all of the remnant that is left at the end times at Christ's return. It's a restatement of what already exists today. The forgiveness of sins through faith. Okay? That, my friends, is what I'm trying to say. The covenants to Israel, the, this, uh, there's only one that has actually already occurred. This one's future. Okay? The covenant of law was a restatement of what already existed. When this covenant occurs, it will be a restatement of what has existed for thousands of years. They're restatements because God wanted pictures for us to see the different two covenants. Okay? That is how it works. Okay? And we're going to see it more and more. You're going to understand it completely. So let's move on. Abraham was in the new covenant before the old covenant even began. Even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. So he was made perfect through the forgiveness of sins by being given God's righteousness. Okay, That's the new covenant. Okay, And Abraham was in it before the old covenant of law through Moses even began. Okay. Why? Because the covenant of law to, that came to Moses was a restatement to corporate Israel of what was already there individually for every individual in the world. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Okay, just like in the repentance video, you become the seed of Abraham when you believe. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In these shall all the nations be blessed. Okay, how, how did this happen? Well, he justified the heathen through faith 
okay, by their believing of the gospel, okay, that he had already preached unto Abraham. So when the nations believe it, they too are justified through faith, just like Abraham was. Okay, and Paul is saying this in the New Testament using the example of Abraham in the Old Testament and how he was justified by faith the same way Paul is justified by faith. So then, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. Whoa! <laughs> It can't be by grace unless it's by faith. That's the whole reason God made it by faith, is that it might be by God's grace. See, therefore it is of my behavior that it might be by grace. Oh, no, well, if it was my behavior, then it would be by my performance that I was saved. You see, it, that's why it's by faith, so it could be by grace. If it's not by faith and faith alone, then it's not by grace. See, that's the whole reason. That's the whole reason of this statement right here. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end, that the promise might be sure to all the seed, okay, not to that only which is of the law, not only to the Jews, but also to that which is of the faith of Abraham, Jew or Gentile, Okay, it is by faith, or else it can't be by grace if it's not by faith. And it's to the Jews and to the Gentiles. For the promise that he should be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law covenant, but through the righteousness of the faith covenant. Okay, it was not to Abraham or his seed, or you or me, through the law, but through the righteousness of faith, believing. Okay? You can't get to heaven by following the law, turning from sin, stop stealing, stop coveting, stop lying, stop doing anything that can't get you to heaven why because you can't do it perfectly how many sins did it take for adam and eve one how many sins does it take for you one because the moment you sin one time even as an unbeliever you can't sin one time because once you sin once you're in the only way to heaven is through the forgiveness category. How do you gain forgiveness of sin? Through faith. Because, see, you can't gain forgiveness through avoidance of sin. Because the sins you avoid don't even need forgiveness. Okay? God's not worried about the sins you avoid. Okay? God provided a lamb, a way of salvation for the sins that you commit. That's why it's by faith and not avoiding sin because it's through the forgiveness of sin. There is no law that can provide life. The law is in the death covenant, not the covenant of life. Okay? Romans 5.13 For until the law, sin was in the world. Oh, sin was in the world until the law, until Moses. But sin is not imputed where there is no law. Well, then there must have been a law. If sin existed in the world prior to Moses, okay, and sin is not imputed where there is no law, okay, then there had to be a law. And as he says, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. He's saying the same thing I'm telling you. Okay. Hey, uh, people were dying before Moses. <laughs> okay. So there had to be a law. Okay. Why? Because they were dying because they sinned. And 
sin is not imputed where there is no law. Okay, there's no condemnation if there is no law. So they wouldn't be dying. That's all he's saying right there. Even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. Even those that did not sin as bad as Adam were still dying. Why? Because they sinned. And sin is not imputed where there is no law. Okay. So who is the figure of him that was to come? <clears throat> All right. Adam. That's why they call him the first Adam and Christ the second Adam. Adam was the figure of Christ. Okay. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift, free gift, by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ. So if one man got us into this mess, God is going to get us out through one man. Not one man and you. Not one man and each man his own behavior. We're out of this mess through one man, Jesus Christ, which hath abounded unto many. By grace, through faith in Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. The death covenant of the law existed prior to Moses. Okay. Genesis 3 is the first restatement of the law. And understand that Genesis 3 was hugely larger than what's recorded in Genesis 3. Okay. The Bible does not necessarily tell us that, but it demonstrates massively that it was much, huge, much larger a conversation between God and man than what is recorded there. God instituted a sacrificial system. Okay. Cain and Abel were sacrificing for sin. None of that's delineated, but that's it was there. That's what happened. God delineated an entire sacrificial system to them. God tells Cain that if he does poorly, sin lieth at the door. Sin is the transgression of the law. God had already reviewed with them the things that were sin, the law. Okay? Murder had already been published as a sin. Noah put animals on the ark in numbers related to their classification of clean or unclean. By sevens if they were clean, two by two if they were unclean. The conversation between God and man in Genesis 3 was hugely larger than we have recorded in the Bible. In fact, you might even say it could have been closer to the full delineation of the Mosaic Law than what we have in chapter 3 because we barely have anything in chapter 3. But one of the key things we do have in chapter 3 is that one of those things that was extremely delineated, even greater than what it was in chapter 3, was the promise of the Redeemer seed of the woman. The promise of Christ, who would have his heel bruised, which is a reference to the seed's death on the cross. There is a verse in Hebrews regarding Moses that says he chose the, to go with the oppression of his people as opposed to living under the blessing of the Pharaoh's house. Because he esteemed the reproach of Christ. Okay, what is the reproach of Christ? The cross. Okay. Daniel and Isaiah both tell us that, they flat out tell us that the Messiah is going to die. Not counting all the Old Testament allusions to his death and the clear stated resurrection statements which his death would have to precede because you have to die before you can resurrect. John the Baptist crying out, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Okay, what happens to the Lamb that cleanses sin? It's, it's, it's killed. Okay. They should have known that Christ was going to die. Okay. 
I can't see God instituting an entire sa sacrificial system at the beginning and not telling them this is a picture of the Messiah and what he's going to do for you. Okay, You really can't say they didn't know. You can't say they didn't know. Okay, And for sure they should have known because the Bible in the Old Testament tells us that the Messiah was going to die. Okay, You can't tell them. You can't say that God did not tell them that Christ wasn't going to die. Okay? We can't keep a doctrine correct for 80 years, let alone thousands. Okay? So, the fact that it was forgotten by the time Jesus came by many people does not mean it was forgotten by all. Like I said, John the Baptist clearly stated the Lamb of God. Okay? Jesus tried to preach it to Peter and the apostles several times. And they just wouldn't. They, they, they were hearing it from Christ himself, and they wouldn't believe it. Okay? Multiple times he tried to tell them that he was going to die, and they wouldn't have it. He even had to call one of them, get thee behind me, Satan. Okay? But the seed of the woman that became the seed of Abraham, that became the seed of David was the promised redeemer in chapter 3 of Genesis. Believing in him, the promised redeemer cleansed sin through all time. Speaking to Abraham, and he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. The sin of Adam and Eve reversed. Believing. All right. Continued notations. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Ah. Uh, so the end of the law did not occur at Christ's death, his burial, his ascension, his resurrection, his birth, his crucifixion, his baptism. It ends when the person comes to believe in the gospel of Christ. Right? For Christ is an end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. You are under the law covenant for your righteousness, which you better hope you're not, because if you're under the law for righteousness, in, in the touch not, taste not, handle not, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, you're going to hell. All right, because you can't keep it perfectly. One time, one sin. That's why you have to have the forgiveness of sins through faith. Okay? Christ is an end to the law. You move from the law covenant of death to the life covenant of faith when you believe. Okay. Did Christ's death on the cross and, and his resurrection and ascension, did that end the, the Jewish covenant? Yes. It ended the picture for the Hebrew people. For the Hebrew people. For the Hebrew people, the sacrificial system, circumcision, all of it ended the Hebrew covenant. But the death covenant of the law continued individually for every person in the world. And it still goes today. You're in the law covenant until you believe then you pass from death unto life, from the flesh covenant to the spirit covenant, from bond to free. Okay? So the death covenant of law continues through all time for every individual until the individual hears the gospel and believes. Christ ended the picture of the law covenant. Christ ended the restatement to corporate Israel. 
He did not end the global covenant of law that every individual was, is, and will be under for all time. The covenants are not time periods. If you think the covenants are time periods, you are confusing the actual global individual covenants with the pictures or restatements of the covenants. Grace is not a time period. It is an eternal attribute of God. It is not even the covenant. The promise is eternal life. For by grace are you saved. Saved, salvation, eternal life. By grace are you saved through faith. So grace is that by which the covenant was given. But it's not the covenant. And the covenant is not a time period. Okay? The covenants separate people, not time periods. If you think they're time periods, you're looking at the pictures, the restatements. You're not looking at the actual covenants. <clears throat> See, all that stuff about the dispensation of grace and the covenant time period of grace and all of a sudden, that's false, okay? 1 Corinthians 9, 17. For if I do this thing will, willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. Okay? This is something that's given to Paul that he's supposed to do. Okay? He's supposed to give out the gospel. It's almost like it's a work assignment. Okay? A dispensing of the gospel is committed to Paul to give to someone else. Okay? If you had heard of the dispensation of grace, that's not a time period, okay? That is the dispensing of the grace of God through the giving out of the gospel. Dispensation of the gospel given to Paul. You don't give people, okay, committed unto him. You don't commit time periods. You don't give time periods to people, okay? He was given a work assignment to dispense the gospel. All right. If you had heard of the dispensation of grace of God, which is given me to you word, it was given to Paul and he's supposed to pass it on to you. The gospel, dispensing of the gospel, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you. Okay. It's given to him. For you to fulfill the word of God. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times. He might gather together in one all things in Christ. Both which are in heaven and which are in earth. Even in him. That's at the end. When it's over. When all of time has been dispensed. That in the dispensation of the fullness of time. It's all over. The end time has come. God is gathering all of them, okay, at the end when time has all been dispensed. But contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. This in the original King James is italicized because it's been added for clarity, okay, the second word gospel, okay? It's not a second gospel, okay? It's a, it's not a different gospel. There is no different gospel. Let him be accursed if they teach another gospel, okay? It's another work assignment. The gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto Paul, committed. Look here. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. Okay? The gospel was committed, the, the gospel to the uncircumcision was committed to Paul. Peter was to take the gospel to the circumcision or the Jews. Paul went to the Gentiles with the gospel. Peter went to the Jews with the gospel. That's all that's saying. Okay, there, there's no time periods. Okay, there's no 
other gospels to this group and a different gospel to this group and Joseph Smith and his Mormons got this gospel and this person got this gospel and this person got now yeah, that's crazy all right the analytical mind syndrome and we all can be guilty of it you know we like to separate things we like to split hairs okay uh, you know look how intelligent I am okay we need to quit doing that because it's not even necessary Everybody knows there was a time when the law came to Moses, okay, and that Christ was an end to the Jewish law, okay, but understand, that's not the covenant of law. That's not the global covenant that goes through all time. You would have to explain it perfectly and in, in, in a lot more detail and better understanding uh, than to say it started at Moses, Okay, if you're going to say grace is a time period, then that is so wrong because then that gives the illusion that grace had a beginning and end. That's insane. Okay, there is no dispensation of grace that's a time period. It's the dispensing of the gospel that is the dispensing of God's grace. Okay, there's no time periods. Okay, I mean, there are time periods, but <laughs> you guys have gone off the, the train is off the rails. All right. Continued notations. <clears throat> All right. Galatians 3.24, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. The law was the schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. What was it teaching us? It should have been teaching you that you need forgiveness. That's what the law did. It puts you under the condemnation of death because you could not keep it perfectly. So it brought you unto Christ who brings you not the avoidance of sin, but the forgiveness of sin through his death on the cross, his burial and resurrection the third day according to the scriptures. That we might be justified by faith. See, faith justifies us through the forgiveness of sin. It's already too late for these sins to be avoided Okay, through the schoolmaster. It's too late for you to have the righteousness of the law to get to heaven because you've sinned one time. Adam and Eve sinned one time. And death is the result. The only way then is through the forgiveness of sins by faith. Okay? But after that faith has come, we are no longer under the schoolmaster. Oh! So the law ends... When somebody believes, just like that other verse, for Christ is an end of the law for righteousness to those that believe, to everyone that believe it. You come to faith in Christ, you're no longer under the law. You've gone from one covenant, the death covenant by the law, to the life covenant through faith. So the law is a schoolmaster that ends when Christ died, no. When he resurrected, no. It ends when faith comes to the individual. The promise of death by the law ends when the promise of life by faith begins. Everyone through the whole Bible is saved the, saved the exact same way. The forgiveness of their committed sin through faith. Only one way exists for the forgiveness of sins, and that is the perfect spotless blood sacrifice. Jesus is the only way because Jesus is the only perfect. You see, why, have you ever asked yourself, why does it say Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by him? Why is he the only way? Because he's the only perfect. People, you can't even pay for your own sins through death and get yourself to heaven. 
You can't even die on the cross like Christ did and get to heaven. See, God always planned to die for you to the point where he made it impossible for you to even die for yourself. If you can't get to heaven dying on the cross for your own sins and avoiding all the other sins, what makes you think you can get to heaven by the sins you turn from or avoid? One sin is all it took. One sin. You have to be perfect and you're not made perfect through the law by avoiding sin because you can't avoid it perfectly. You have to be made perfect through the forgiveness of sin. How do you gain the forgiveness of sin? Belief through faith. Okay? Turning from your sin doesn't save anybody. It doesn't save anyone. And if you think, if you are turning from your sin to gain that salvation, to get into heaven, then you are using your own righteousness as opposed to the righteousness of God through faith. And that is, that is scary. That is hell scary. That's scary hell. Paul's testimony that the Old Testament saints were saved by faith. Hebrews 3.16, For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, but with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? So he brings them out of Egypt. They're walking around the wilderness. <clears throat> okay. And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Okay, Hebrews 4.1 Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. Unto Paul, the apostles, the New Testament church, as well as unto the Old Testament coming out of Egypt people. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. They did not have faith. That's why they were dead physically and spiritually. Okay, let's go on. 1 John 2.25 <clears throat> Alright, these are some verses that just show the beauty of the covenants. Um, 1 John 2.25 And this is the promise that he, he hath promised us even eternal life. That's the covenant, eternal life, the life covenant. Hebrews 7, 16, who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, you know, like Hebrews calls them, carnal ordinances, touch not, taste not, handle not, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill. Those are carnal commandments. They're in the physical realm. You do them through your effort, but after the power of an endless life. Okay. Not after the law of a carnal co covenant, but after everlasting life. That everlasting life comes through faith, not through following the carnal commandments in the death covenant. You can't get to the life covenant by doing something like the law that's in the death covenant. But it is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So you go from the death covenant to the life covenant by believing the gospel. Is the law then against the promise of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, fairly righteousness would have come by the law. Okay, But there wasn't. Okay, Law 
uh, is the bringer of death, not life. If there was a law that could have brought life, God would have brought it. But there wasn't, because we can't keep it. Okay? For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, or death. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Two different covenants. Okay? For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved, and in them that perish. To the one we are the savior of death unto death, and to the other the savior of life unto life. Death covenant, life covenant. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Law, sin, and death. That's death covenant. Spirit and life in Christ Jesus. That's the life covenant. For the wages of sin is death. Wages of sin. Break the law and you die. Sin is a transgression of the law. Okay. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The gift of God is the life covenant through ourselves, through our own behavior, through us, through our performance. No, through Jesus Christ our Lord. His work, his death on the cross and resurrection. Believe on him, okay, and you have eternal life. Focus on the law and you're going to hell, okay? That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Not our righteousness, God's righteousness, righteousness that comes by Jesus Christ. Sin reigned unto death. Grace reigns through the imputed righteousness of God that is given to us unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. His work, His death, burial, and resurrection. John 5, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. And he shall not come into condemnation, the condemnation of the law, which is death, but is passed from death unto life, movement from one covenant into to the other one. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. <laughs> you become a, a, you come into the life covenant through believing. Okay? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. That's the death covenant. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth the fruit unto death. The law covenant. The death covenant by the law. Hebrews 9.15, And for this cause he is the mediator of a New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions. Okay, Christ's death, not the death covenant. Christ's death for the redemption to buy us back from our sins or transgressions that were under the first testament. They which are called might receive the promise of eternal life. See, that first covenant was just about the death, sin, the law. There was no life in it. Okay, under the First Testament. They which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance, the new covenant. Okay, the law brings death, faith brings life. People, there are a lot of reciprocal things in the world today, okay? This is not one of them. Breaking the law brought death. Following the law does not bring life. Okay? You cannot get to the life covenant by doing something in the death covenant. Faith brings life. Breaking the law brings death. But following the law does not bring life. It's not reciprocal. Okay? 
All right. Un think of it like this. Okay. An atheist can go through his entire life and not kill somebody. An atheist can give money to the poor. Okay. But those works have no connection to God. No works have any connection to God. Period. Unless you go through faith first. What good is any work? Any work if the person doesn't believe in God. It's of no value at all. What has the value? What lends the value to any work is faith. See, you know, somebody could have accidentally came by and ate of the fruit of the tree of life, okay? It, it, the, law, the, the works of the law have no meaning unless the person believes. Okay? That's why your works being built in your house of wood, hay, and stubble or gold, precious, silver, precious stones, okay, that's why there has to be a, the foundation first. You build on your foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or stubble. The foundation is Christ. The works have no connection to the solid rock except through the foundation. Otherwise, you're building your house in midair. <laughs> okay? You have to have faith. You have to believe in God before you can honor God with your works. Okay? Faith has to come first. Okay? It's not reciprocal. The law brought death. The only way the law could ever bring life is if you followed it and never sinned one time even as an unbeliever you couldn't sin because as soon as you sin one time you're in the only way to heaven is through the forgiveness of sin category and that is why christ is the only way because he's the only perfect all right second corinthians 3 6 who also hath made us able ministers of the new testament not of the letter okay the law, you know the phrase letter of the law, this may be actually where it came from, but of the spirit, for the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth light. But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall the ministration of the spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more the ministration of righteousness succeed in glory. The new covenant is much better than the death covenant. Or I mean the life covenant is much better than the death covenant. Okay? All right? I mean, look, he calls it the ministration of death. That's what he called the law, the ministration of death. The minister of death, that's so much death that it sounds like the title to a Charlie Bronson movie, okay? The old minister of death, okay? Death comes by the law. Life comes through faith. Once you sin one time, you're in the only way to perfection is through the forgiveness category. You can only be made perfect through the forgiveness of your sin, not through the avoidance of your sin. That is why he is the only way because he is the only perfect as stated before, you can't even die on the cross for your own sins. It's not going to get you to heaven. You can't pay the price of sin, which is death. Okay? Or you can pay the price of sin, which is death, but you didn't pay the price of life, which is a spotless perfection. So you can't even die for yourself. Adam and Eve sinned one time, and that was all she wrote. They had to have a redeemer from death and hell. They had to have forgiveness. They could not make it to heaven by avoiding sin. They had to have the forgiveness of sin with only one sin. One sin. Offend the law in one point and you are guilty of all. That's what James says oh, right before chapter 2, if you get what that means. 
Okay. You can't arrive in the life covenant by doing something that is in the death covenant. Death comes by the law and life comes through faith. This faith in Christ alleviates us from the penalty of the law, which is death. Because now, due to the faith, we're forgiven of our sins, so we're no longer under the condemnation of, the, of death. You can't do that through avoidance of sin, okay? Because avoiding sin is not the problem. Those sins aren't the problem. The sins you avoid aren't the problem. The problem is the sins that you haven't avoided. Salvation is through faith because it brings forgiveness of committed sin. Salvation has nothing to do with avoided sin. Okay? All right. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it.